on so uh i don't quite remember where it is but let me find it all right this should take us to the right place there should be a link to the classifier so this is probably the website that you were on after you build the model you uh so let's just capture some images So we'll capture some images. We'll do train. It should build your model. And then after you do this, you hit export. You go to, you just like put it in your downloads. And then when you open the application, the, the tutorial, if you open the tutorial, you will be able to see a place where you can upload it. So let's go to the PIC thing and we'll be able to upload it. When you go to the PIC, you go down here to the personal image classifier and there's a place where you can upload a model. So here you just hit upload file and this is how you can put your model in. So then you just hit open, hit okay. And then this will replace the file, which is okay with me. And then the model is there. Is that All right, okay, yeah. Right. I don't think you can publish, yeah, you. Uh, I don't think you can publish it to the gallery because of it has an extension. Yeah, exactly. That's a that's a good observation. So I think we sent out a message in Discord saying that you can download your application as an AIA file and then upload it. So what that means is you go up here to the top left, you go to projects, and then you go to uh, export selected project to my computer. You can save the file. It'll, it'll maybe take a second to package it, but once it finishes packaging, it should pop up a dialog. There we go. And uh, you can name it whatever you want. You hit save. And then there should be a place in the Google form. I will just demonstrate. If you go to the Google form, which is here, there is a, um, so apparently it says screenshot, but you can still upload any file you want. So you would just go here and hit upload and then it'll be okay. Hope that helps. Yeah, all right, thanks. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so it looks like we are a little bit more full, so we can get started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's class. We'll be talking about some pretty interesting things today. Uh, it's going to be pretty chill, low key, as in we're going to cover a bunch of different really cool applications of convolutional neural networks that'll involve the knowledge that we discussed earlier. And um, we won't be getting super, super in depth into the theory, but I'll give you a taste of how they work. So you have the general idea. And this is gonna be pretty similar to the class that we had yesterday about NLP in the, in the sense that we present a very high level overview of the fundamental concepts behind applying convolutional neural networks to computer vision and how they can be used to solve a lot of tasks that tasks that seem very disconnected, uh, but they're actually connected in a very fundamental way. So we'll present the high level framework for solving these kinds of tasks using convolutional neural networks. And then we'll dive into several very interesting specific instances of this general framework. So as you can see on the, on the slide here, we have body and face pose landmark estimation. This is just a fancy way of saying Snapchat filters are made like this. Um, or other things that you might imagine. Autoencoders are a, a really interesting concept that can help us learn compressed representations of data very efficiently. Uh, and we'll talk about what this means in a moment. And then finally, we have generative models. Generative models are super cool because they are essentially, they, they essentially showcase the creativity and uh, yeah, the creativity of, of machine learning models where people can generate new faces that we've never seen before generate new landscapes that we've never seen before, et cetera. So all of these, they seem very, very disconnected, right? Very different tasks, but they're all connected in this very fundamental way. And so what is that fundamental way? Let's, uh, let's explore this question. So remember yesterday, we presented this very general model of neural NLP that was basically this framework that I'm trying to construct for computer vision, right? Because remember yesterday when we were talking about NLP, um, this is a very, very general framework. So imagine that you have a bunch of input sentences. 
uh, and then you encode them into an abstract representation or what we call an encoding. This is a computer understandable method that you know the computer can understand. The computer can look at this representation and be like, aha, yes, I understand what's happening, even though it might not make sense to you. And if you recall, the representation is usually represented as a vector. So in our terms, a vector is just a list of numbers all the way down to a bunch of numbers. This could be you know, many, many dimensions. It could be like 1600 dimensions or in other words, 1600 different numbers in this vector. So um, this was the model of NLP. So once you have this encoding of your input, the model sort of understands what's happening. Once it understands what's happening, you can go ahead and do a lot of different cool stuff. There are different things that you can do. You know, one thing that you can do is directly take this representation of the entire sentence and apply a fully connected layer uh, to do classification. So these tasks include spam detection, toxicity analysis, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to do classification. Classification is perhaps one of the easier tasks or more straightforward tasks. There are also some pretty interesting and quirky ones like translation, playwriting, you know, writing sentences in the style of a certain author or maybe even in the style of a certain person. I have some friends who trained NLP models to text like them. Um, this is possible because Facebook stores all of your data and you can download it uh, off of Messenger. So they trained a model on their text messages and they built a model that texts just like them. I think it's kind of cool and creepy at the same time. <laughs> And finally, you have image captioning, which is taking in an image and without any you know, assumptions about this image, you can generate a description of what's happening in this image, which I think is quite fascinating. So this was just a brief review of what we talked about yesterday with neural NLP. Now, as it turns out, this, this sort of model, this general framework is not really just applicable to neural NLP. I think this is pretty general for all of deep learning. This is basically what deep learning is all about. You're trying to build neural networks here. You know, in these neural networks, this is a neural network. This is an encoder. This is obviously a neural network as the picture su suggests. This is also a neural network. So we have these different neural networks that can do different things. And in all of deep learning, we are just, rep we are interested in learning a couple of things. Number one is how to get input signals. This could be images, it could be signals from a health monitor, or it could be images, sentences, anything. You wanna have input signals. You wanna you want to use deep learning to create a nice representation of that signal, which is this encoding. And then you want more neural networks to decode this signal, to turn it into something that we want, either you know a classification or a sequence of things like a generation. So this is really all about deep, this is really all deep learning is about learning robust and good representations such that you can feed them into more neural networks and perform tasks. This is basically it. So naturally, if we think that this is a general framework for deep learning, well, then we can apply it to computer vision pretty easily because com computer vision has really been taken over by deep learning. So let's extend this to computer vision. It looks literally the same. If I remove my annotations here, you can see that not much has changed. Um, but of course, of course, your inputs are going to be images now. We are still interested in finding an encoding, an abstract representation of this. Um, and remember, you would do this with a convolutional neural network that has filters or what we called kernels. These mean the same thing, they're synonyms. Filters and kernels that extract features, extract features. So this is the whole point. You have an encoder that extracts these features. And what are these features? Well, they actually represent your abstract representation or your encoding. Because to a computer, an image of a cat itself is very disorganized. It's just a bunch of random pixels that are oriented in a shape such that humans can tell it's a cat. But to the computer, this means nothing. So when you have an input, it's, it's meaningful, meaningful, to humans and, but to computers, they are very confused when they see this. The whole point of an encoder is to take it into this abstract representation. We want computers to understand it. And we don't care whether humans understand it, but in general, when we do this abstract encoding, com 
I mean, humans are always like, what the heck is going on? Because it's just a big bag of numbers. Once you extract a bunch of features, it's just a big bag of numbers. Humans can't really tell what's going on, but this means something to the computer. It's very significant to the computer because it sort of takes all of this stuff that's meaningful to humans, you know, the cat that has pointy ears and has a brown coat of fur and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it takes that and it compresses it into a way that computers can understand. So this again is our abstract representation, our encoding. And then given all of this stuff with our CNN, we can again do whatever we want. We can either put a fully connected layer on the convolutional neural network. This is exactly what we talked about on Wednesday, I believe, uh, where you take all the features that you get from the image and you put them into a fully connected layer and you can do a bunch of tasks. These are the easier tasks or more straightforward tasks. These are the harder tasks, but you can do things like basic classification. SciFAR is a list of 10 classes I think it includes things like person, automobile, ship, whatever. Um, in fact, I can search it up here, SciFAR 10 data set and show you guys some examples. This is the SciFAR data set. Um, these are only a couple of the uh, classifications, but if we open this image in a new tab, we can zoom in. And as you can see, SciFAR 10 is just a big data set of images that have their associated classes. They have the airplane, the automobile, the bird, cat, deer, dog, and they have uh, four more classes in SciFAR. Um, but you can basically feed all these images into a neural network. You can have a convolutional neural network that has 10 output neurons and you can do classification with them. So maybe not the next time you point your phone at a dog, it'll know that it's a dog. Um, there's this thing called ImageNet, which is just a bigger SciFAR. I think this one has like 100 classes or something. I'm not entirely sure. There's also MNIST, which is the handwritten digit data set that you might have seen around MNIST. I can show you another example of MNIST. This is MNIST. You might have seen it. Very, very popular. It's like the hello world of machine learning, where you try to build a neural network that can classify these, these, these numbers into whatever number it is and uh, other different things. There's also stuff like video classification that you can do. But on the harder end of the spectrum, and we'll talk about all of these different tasks, we'll show you examples of what they are and how roughly they're solved. But there are some more interesting tasks here like bounding box detection. So not only are we going to figure out what's in an image, if there are multiple things in an image, for example, if you, look, uh, if you look at my virtual background, there are computers, there are desks, there are monitors, laptops, whatever. And if you just fed this into a neural network, you might predict one of them. But what if there are multiple things in the image? That's, that, I mean, that's a more difficult problem, right? So you have to put bounding boxes around everything. Like if there's a person here, you need to draw a bounding box over them. If they're holding a cell phone, then you need to draw a bounding box around that. So this becomes a much more complicated problem. There's object tracking, which is you need to track an object throughout a video frame. How do you maintain the ID of, a, of an object while it's moving around? There's also one that we're going to talk about that I didn't write here, which is called segmentation. And we'll talk about what this means in a second. But uh, yeah, so these are all the different things that can be accomplished, not necessarily using a fully connected layer in the harder area, but definitely classification is accomplished using fully connected layers. These can be accomplished with fully connected layers, but some recent methods have moved away from FC and done other things. And we'll talk about what this is. Um, so this is one thing. You can do these sort of simpler tasks, but there are also a whole slew of other really cool fancy tasks that are not using fully connected layers that uh, still use this fundamental model of computer vision or model of deep learning, where you have a bunch of fancy things like pose estimation this is something we'll talk about today. Given an image of a person, how do you identify where all, the, all their important joints are? If you think about it, this is very important in video game design, perhaps. If you want to design a video game where the actions or, or the movements of the characters is really fluid and very human-like, well, one way that you might accomplish this is to record a video of a person moving, record their joints moving, and then encode the motion of their joints into your program. That would be one interesting application of pose estimation. There's also things like scene rendering. There are, there was, there were recently a couple of papers or a whole chain of papers that were coming out about this thing called neural radiance fields, where you can, you can represent an object 
uh, from one angle, and then a computer can learn to rotate this image, uh, rotate this object, and you can view it from a bunch of different angles after only have seen it from one. So this is again a super super interesting uh, application of computer vision. Um, super resolution Nvidia is doing a lot of work here. If you've ever thought about playing video games, uh, and if you know about playing video games, then you know that if your computer is not good enough, you have to turn the graphics settings down, right? Because it's too expensive to render all of these shapes, all of these graphics with a bad computer. But Nvidia is trying to do something super cool. They're trying to render things, you know, render things with their traditional graphics engines at a lower resolution and using deep learning to, to take these low resolution images and upsample them to uh, whatever it is, maybe maybe 1080p or even higher, maybe 2K, 2.5K. Um, and they use deep learning. And it's much, much faster than actually running the calculations, running the math for how light bounces off of something or whatever. Uh, neural networks have learned this so well and so quickly that NVIDIA is building the super rev resolution. They call it DLSS into their uh, GPUs. Uh, so this is very cool. And then, of course, there's this last thing that we will talk about, which is image generation using what is called generative adversarial networks. Um, very cool idea, but basically uh, the TLDR is that computers can be creative and they can generate, they can imagine new images of things that do not exist based on some statistics about how things generally look in the regular world. So we'll talk about this too. But hopefully this gives you a good overview or a good high level bird's eye view of what computer vision looks like when you, when you think about deep learning. You have input images, you encode them somehow, this gives you an abstract representation, and then you apply something. It, it, it's not very clear what this is because there are a lot of different things that people are doing. It can be a fully connected layer, it can be other fancy things like deconvolution, or maybe you know dilated, dilated uh, things like that. Uh, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about some of these too, but other fancy things can also be done to take these abstract representations and be like, let's create something new out of it. Let's create a classification. Let's create a segmentation map. Let's create a super resolution image so that people can play their games on worse hardware or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, any questions about this or a thumbs up if this makes sense? Okay, great. So let's move on. Uh, and now we'll be talking about five specific instances of this cool idea. Uh, so today's agenda, we will be talking about a couple of, uh, uh, of uses of convolutional neural networks in computer vision. We will be exploring them in depth to a certain extent, not, not totally in depth, but you will sort of have the idea of how they're solved. And uh, we'll see some cool examples of them in action, um, perhaps with a demo and perhaps with a lab at the very end. So let's dive in. The first thing that we're gonna be talking about is this problem called object detection. Um, and then these are actually two separate problems, but I've grouped them together because they're a little bit similar. There's one object detection and two object segmentation. So object detection is this problem of, uh, uh, you know, of the following. You have an image, right? And in a lot of cases, the image will only contain one object. If you think back to the SciFar example that I was showing earlier, um, it's not so interesting. So let's go to SciFar again because each of these images contains exactly one thing. Um, this contains a ship and there's really nothing else in there. there. This one contains a dog, there's really nothing else in there, a deer, automobile, horse, etc. But real world images are very complicated. Um, if we just like look at, you know, wallpaper, landscape, just like, eh, whoops, landscape, just something as simple as this, right? You have, you have mountains, you have water, you have trees, you have many different trees, you have the sky, and, you, and, and there's just a whole lot of different things happening in the image. And if you were to put this through a classifier, it only, it would only give you one answer, which is bad, because there are lots of different things in your image, and you want to be able to detect all of them. So object detection is interested in, in drawing these things called bounding boxes. Bounding boxes around specific instances of an object in the image. So here you see five guys standing in front of a camera. And what you would expect is that you draw five bounding boxes around the people like we have shown here, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one such thing, it's called object detection. There's something called segmentation as well. 
And so segmentation is not about drawing bounding boxes. It's actually predicting for every single pixel in an image what class it belongs to. Um, and so let's try to clarify that a little bit. I hope by now we all understand that images are represented as pixels. So if you have a three by three image, you would have a bunch of numbers here, maybe like nine, two, 55, six, seven, nine, blah, 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 blah. And in fact, you would not just have nine numbers, you would have nine times three, which is 27 numbers because you have RGB. You need to represent all three channels of your image, right? So what this is saying is that for all i, j, i, j is just a location in this matrix. So if i is the row and j is the column, then this would be, this would be one, one. It's sort of like a grid. You can think of this as like a 2D grid, your 2D coordinate axis. For every single i, j in the image, I wanna predict whether it's part of, a, of, 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 a, of some class. In this case, if we were trying to build a segmentation mask for a person, what, what's happening here is that for every single pixel in the image, every single pixel, this could be like a 500 by 800 image. For all 40, 0, 0, 0, 0, all 400,000 pixels in this image, for every single one, you need to predict whether it belongs to a, a person or the background. So as you can see, if I were to eyeball this, you know, it would sort of look like this. There's a person here, there's a person here, there's a person here, there's a person here, but their legs, make sure to cut out their legs, uh, make sure to cut out their legs, there's a person here. And uh, for every single uh, pixel inside, these, uh, inside this area, you would mark it as a person. And clearly this model has done this. So this is great. Now, there is a difference between these two types of segmentation. Remember, a segmentation is just about um, creating um, this classification for every single key point. This is what we call a mask. This is what this is called. To create a segmentation mask for an image is to say for every pixel, what class does it belong to? But there's a difference between semantic and instant segmentation. Semantic segmentation is concerned with classes in general. So you might see a class for a person. Maybe you might see a class for an automobile. We'll see an example of this very, very soon. But you're concerned with classes. And elements in the same class are treated as the same as each other. But there is another interesting thing called instance segmentation, which is where every single instance of a class needs to be separated. You might think of applications for both of these. You know, in particular, maybe for self-driving cars, right? A car has a picture of a scene on the road. And for the purposes of obstacle avoidance, it doesn't really care whether person one is person two or person three, whether they're the same person. It just needs to know that it's a person because you don't want to hit any different person. We don't really discriminate based on the person when we're trying to decide who we don't want to hit. We don't want to hit anyone. So this is an example where segment semantic segmentation would be more appropriate. It's basically instance agnostic. But there are cases when you do want instant segmentation. For example, if you were trying to build a system that monitors the activity of certain people in a certain space, for example, tracking somebody in your home, because maybe you have an elderly citizen, you need to track them, make sure that they're, they're doing well, that they haven't fallen on the ground or something. You don't want to confuse your elderly person with your two-year-old kid running around. Um, and they're, they're, different, they're different people and you have different goals. Like for the old person, you wanna make sure that they don't fall. And for the kid, you wanna make sure, you know, for example, they don't run outside, get lost or whatever. This is where the identity of the person comes into play and you care whether it's person one or person two, these are not the same thing. Um, and in general, the same models can be used to solve both of these problems, I think. So this is, would be an example of the, the, the application of object detection and segmentation in real life. This one is obviously detection and this one is segmentation. So the most, I think the most striking or the most evocative sort of application of this is in, um, is in self-driving cars because when you're driving or maybe you haven't driven yet, but maybe when you're in the car and you're looking outside and your parents are driving, it's sometimes overwhelming the amount of information that they have to take in, right? There are lanes that you have to keep in, keep inside of. There are people that you need to make sure you don't hit. There are cars coming all around you, doing stupid things, changing lanes at the wrong time, trying to hit you or whatever. So there's a lot of information that's coming into you and you need to process it all. And it becomes so much more obvious when you ask a computer to do it. 
you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, we would never have imagined that computers are this good at identifying objects in their periphery or, or just in their sort of line of sight. Um, but of course, this is a particularly difficult scene. This is in New York City. Um, but as you might imagine, it's super important for a self-driving or some kind of autonomous vehicle to be able to identify objects. You know, you don't want to hit people. You don't want to hit cars. You don't want to run into poles. You don't want to run traffic lights. This is why this might be so important, the traffic light detector. Um, and so this is, a, this is an important problem. And then in segmentation, segmentation is where, as you can see, for every single pixel in the image, it's sort of overlaid this this filled in color for every single type of person. Does anyone want to tell me whether this is instance, instance or semantic segmentation? Semantic. So is this instance or semantic? We have something in chat. Instance? Oh, okay. So we have two disagreeing answers. We have someone in chat saying it's semantic and someone saying it's instance. Uh, does anyone want to explain? So like Ben, uh, why do you think it's an instant segmentation thing? Or not, okay, that's all good. Um, so the correct answer is in fact semantic and, um, and Kevin, Serena, Everett all correct because it's not detecting which car, it's just detecting cars, people, bicycles. Yes, that is correct. And it may be a little bit hard to tell because this um, maybe the, the video is not so clear over Zoom, but all of the different cars are the same color and there's no text or anything, no ID number to, di to differentiate them. It's all treating them the same. And you also have the people who are all red. So they're all treated the same as well. Um, and this would basically, this is a telltale sign that we don't really care about the differences between people. This is indeed semantic segmentation. Um, and this makes sense in, in the context of self-driving cars, at least. You don't want to be deciding who to hit and who not to hit based on different people. You just make sure that you don't hit any people or don't hit any bicycles or don't hit any, hit any other cars. So um, very cool. The, I think these are really interesting videos to just watch. It's just fascinating to just sit here and look at what computers have been able to do. And uh, yeah, let's let's try to build up a general sort of idea of how they work. So object detection, there are many models for object detection. This is just one of them. It's called YOLO, uh, very interestingly named. This actually stands for you only look once. And so this is actually a more recent development. There were some other older models that were a little bit slower and YOLO came along and it said, you only look once. This is basically one of the hit big benefits of YOLO. You only have to process the image once and thus it's very fast. And so what you're seeing here, this is, I don't know if this is precisely a YOLO thing, but if it runs in real time, real time, it's very likely a YOLO model. Uh, YOLO models are extremely quick and this thing can run in real time, meaning that every single frame you feed it, maybe 10 every second or 20 every second, it can process it within that amount of time and there's no backlog, which is really, again, quite impressive. So this is YOLO. And as you might see, there are some things that you might recognize that are very obvious here. This looks very much like our convolutional neural network, right? We have a bunch of convolutions um, over here, but of course we have residuals here. We have convolutional sets. We haven't talked about what residuals are. Don't worry about them. They're basically just something that helps improve performance. It doesn't really do much to the convolution. The fundamental idea still stays the same. You have convolutions that are extracting features. So it looks like to me that throughout this entire section, they're doing what we call feature extraction. And in the context of our big general framework for, for, for computer vision, this is the encoder, right? because it's taking this image, it's encoding it. And this right here, this last thing is our, what we called the abstract computer understandable representation. It's very confusing to humans, but somehow there's some structure in there that 
makes it uh, very meaningful to a computer. And basically, you apply the, the fancy other stuff. This is the fancy other stuff that you are using to predict the bounding boxes. Uh, I won't talk about what they are exactly, but uh, you can think of these as convolutional, additional convolutional layers. So yellow is actually kind of interesting in the manner that after using convolutional layers to extract the features, it uses additional convolutional layers to, um, to extract the bounding boxes. So basically, for each of these little network parts, it'll output a, 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 a prediction. It'll actually do three stages of predicting, predict one, predict two, predict three. But what the prediction looks like is this huge five plus, 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 C array for each thing. So why is it five plus C? Well, for every single object in the image, right? We need this number of things to describe it. We need four coordinates to describe the bounding box. You know, if you if you if you know the minimum number of of, of numbers that you can use to describe any rectangle is four because you need x1, y1, and x2, y2. These, these four points will uniquely determine a rectangle. And whenever you wanna determine a rectangle, this is basically you saying, ah, this is a, this is a thing. And so that's why you need these four values. You might ask why, we, why do we need five? Well, there's also one thing that contains the probability of it being an object, probability of object. Because the way that YOLO works is that it has a bunch of different proposals for where objects are. You know, let's use a more static example here. You know, if there are people here, it'll predict not only the purple boxes, but it'll predict all of these random looking boxes around here. And the, 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 the four values are, are exactly like the four values for the box, but you also have one value for whether it actually is a thing, for probability of it being a thing. Because if you have a box that's up here, there's like nothing there except for a corner of this dude's head, which we will just ignore. Um, it's just, there's just nothing there. So then the, the, this one value, the probability that it being an actual object will be very low. So these are the five values. Now, why do we need plus C values? Does anyone wanna guess what C is? Yeah, this is more of a difficult question, but C is the number of classes. Remember that when we're doing object detection, as you can obviously see in this video, there are a lot of different things happening. You know, you're trying to detect traffic lights, cars, people everywhere, buses. So there are a bunch of different classes. And as, you know, as you'll notice, the model can determine which one is which. Like it knows that a person is a person and a car is a car and they're not confusing uh, one class with the other. So then you need five sort of outputs. This is basically equivalent to the way that we described com uh, with regular neural networks, where if you wanted to do classification, you would have, uh, if you wanted to do classification with C classes, then you would require C output neurons, where you would put the probability of the object being each class in those C neurons. So what this thing does, again, just as a, as a very, as a very High level summary just to organize all of our thoughts here features it's extracting features and this is another another neural network thing here that outputs predictions so it outputs the predictions but how does it output its predictions for 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 all of the bounding boxes that it proposes it basically does it basically does brute force it goes through this image, it might go through an image and it'll propose all types of bounding boxes like this, like this, like this, like this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It'll fill the entire image with bounding boxes. And for each of these bounding boxes, so we will say for each box, predict five plus C or, or, or for each box predict five plus C values. 
So what I have, so you might notice that there's a little bit of an inconsistency in what I've said here. I said that it tries a bunch of different boxes first, and then it tries to predict whether there are objects in them. But then you might ask, why do we need the four boxes, four points for predicting the bounding boxes again? Well, there is this little bit of a minute detail. It's called an anchor. These are all anchors. It's got a bunch of these anchors everywhere, anchors everywhere, all of these anchors all across the image. And these four values are to refine the anchor. So for each anchor, it might try to shift it a little bit to make sure that it fits the object correctly. For example, you might have an anchor that looks like this, but you might want to shift it more laterally, uh, shift it top bottom so that the box becomes a little bit better fitting to the person. So these four values are to refine the anchor, but there are a bunch of these anchors literally everywhere. The anchors cover all the entire image, and that's why you can think of it as saying, just for every single location in the image, try to refine four, four points to refine anchor. So once you've refined the anchor, you can determine, is there object there? And then you can be like, for the C values, it is what object, which, which object, which object class. And so when you put all these together and you do this for all anchors, you can basically find the ones where this value is super high you want to find all the ones where there is probably an anchor there and you can just display them. Display, display box if this value is high, right? So it basically just goes to the entire image. It only looks once. That's why it's called you only look once. It only looks once. It looks at all of these anchors. It tries to shift them around a little bit to be optimal to be optimally placed. It asks, is there an object there? And then uh, if there's an object there, it'll also know which object it is. And then it'll spit out all the ones where it, it thinks that there's a really good object there. There's a really significant object there. So how does this work? Well, we won't talk about this specifically. If we actually did, it would be quite simple. It would just be a bunch of convolutional layers that output something of this shape. But don't worry too much about this. I think it's more important to have the general idea here where you extract the features and you use these features to predict these five plus C values for all the anchors. And you just choose the ones that are really good. Uh, does this make sense? A thumbs up if it makes sense or a question, feel free to throw it in the chat. Yeah, so there's a question, when would a computer not have to look once? Um, so YOLO is actually a little bit of a smarter model than previous ones. There used to be these things called fast RCNNs. These were the uh, predecessors to YOLO and they were quite slow. And basically the way they worked is they, they took a, an, an image and they applied something called a region proposal network to find all of the places where it thought that there were super, you know, there's a super high probability of there being images. And then for each of these things, it went in and applied another neural network to try to classify them and refine the bounding boxes. So this was a two-step process. And so it, it, doesn't, it didn't look once, it looked twice. Uh, and this turned out to be less efficient than simply saying, just at the same time, for all anchors, just bash the problem. Just I'll put a bunch of numbers and then let's pick the best ones. Um, hope that answers your question. We won't talk. We won't be talking about fast RCNN today because it's a little bit more complicated, and it's uh, YOLO is just uh, it's much more commonly used because of how fast it is. But that's a really good question. All right, let's move on. The next thing that we can talk about is masks mask RCNN for segmentation. This one I will be very, very quick about because um, I don't think that the details are too interesting. All you have to know is that in this initial stage, again, to emphasize the fact that we're talking about this general model of deep learning, these are where you extract features. And then for every single pixel in the image, 
it'll output a um a a a, a classification for whether it thinks it's maybe a person or a ball or trees in the background or a person. So it'll just, you have an art model architecture that takes in an image, an image X, you put it through this model and it gives you something Y, but the size of X is equal to the size of Y. So what this means is that for, if you have an image of size like 500 by 800, then you would get out another thing of size 500 by 800, except there would be a mask around all the people that you think are there. So just imagine that these are people, they don't look very much like people, but this would be the mask and you would build a neural network to predict the mask. So um, very simple conceptually, there are some implementation details uh, that we will just gloss over for now. Just know that there's a, you can, you can basically construct a neural network to, to do anything for you. And then you just ask gradient descent to be like, yeah, find the best parameters that make it work sort of well. And you will get a fairly good model. So again, segmentation can be used to do things like this. You take in this big image here and for every frame in the video, you will just feed it through the, 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 the segmentation thing. And it'll, it'll, it'll look through everything, assign a, a class to every single pixel and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So that was object detection and segmentation. It was very closely related to classifying images, but they're a little bit more complicated, right? Because we're interested in sort of disentangling the different components in an image. We don't just want to know in general what's happening. We want to pinpoint what exactly is in the image. So there's this next thing that I want to talk about, which is called key point estimation. Um, and this is actually, if you're curious, this is how Snapchat filters work. This is how Zoom filters work, if you've ever played with those, um, et cetera. And then there's also, I mean, so face key point estimation is how Zoom and, and Snapchat do their things. And there's also this thing called key point estimation, which has a lot of applications, perhaps in the gaming industry or the analysis of gates for medical purposes, or just a whole lot of different things that you can do. Um, key point, this is body key point estimation is very important for, and this is face key point estimation. So we'll be talking about two, uh, I think two very interesting and, uh, and impactful works that, that attack these two problems. They're not necessarily the only ways that you can do key point estimation, but I will just discuss in brief what they generally do. So for facial key point estimation, there's this thing called open pose. And for any kind of key point estimation, this is sort of glossing over some of the details, but the fundamental idea is that you apply a neural network or some kind of model, it doesn't have to be a neural network, but people have found neural networks to be the best at doing this kind of stuff. You apply a neural network to generate response maps. And these response maps should be very hot or red in this case, when it thinks that there's a key point, the red means that I think there's a key point and blue means it's not a key point. So if you can see here, there is this uh, image uh, of Mr. Leonardo DiCaprio and for their eye, their eye is right here. And then if you wanted to sort of detect this, then you would put this through a convolutional neural network and it would generate a response map with a big dot where his eye is supposed to be. And this is the model's way of saying, I think that there's a key point here. Um, now, how exactly this, this works is, um, is a little bit more complicated because if you think about it, you break his face up into all of these different chunks, these what we call a region of interests, and you predict all these response maps. So right here, you might get response maps that are, that are, that are around his, his mouth, his nose. Um, and then there are some other techniques after you get these response map, some more algorithms that can sort of enforce a prior based on what faces generally look like. Because we know that, you know, if you have a person, their eye is not going to be below their nose. Like that doesn't, this doesn't happen. This does not happen. So there is a model that we can use, some kind of statistical model that says in general, you know, eyes are, are actually not below the nose. So um, 
after you get these response maps, you will sort of regularize them with this model. You will refine them with this model, and then you will output this, what is what looks like this. So this CEC LM is the model that I was talking about earlier with all these convolutional layers that are predicting response maps, and then they have another algorithm to enforce this prior. But you can see that now when we use this new algorithm, uh, these were these were other approaches. I think this one is definitely not convolutional neural network based, but this one you can see fails on this example. You see this dude's face from a side profile and then it thinks his eye is over here, uh, which is not great. Um, but now with the advent of convolutional neural networks, which are exploited in CECLM, you can see that the side profile is actually done correctly for the first time and not even for this one. So convolutional neural networks are very powerful. Again, the idea is that you learn to generate heat maps based on where it thinks the points are. And then it applies an algorithm to take all these key points in and refine them a little bit based on how faces are generally structured. So um, pretty impressive work from their group. Anyone have any questions about facial key point estimation? Oh, and then by the way, if you wanted to you know, use this for a Snapchat filter, for example, Snapchat filters can uh, cover your entire face except for your eyes with uh, with a, like a broccoli broccoli skin or whatever. So then you would basically take all of your eye key points, your eye key points, and you would take everything that's outside these eye key points and you would apply the broccoli thing. And then you would just leave the eyes there. And maybe it would also leave your mouth there. So you would get broccoli everywhere else. You know, you get your broccoli thing. I don't know how to draw, but you get broccoli everywhere except for these eyes. And the reason that you can do this is because you did key point estimation to find where their eyes were so that you could break them out from the filter. Uh, or in other cases, you know, if you ever have effects done on your eyes to make them really big, then it'll find these points around the eyes and it'll stretch them out. <laughs> it'll stretch them out. So then your, um, your eyes look bigger or whatever it may be. So um, given these facial landmarks, this is how people can build Snapchat filters. If, you ever, if you've ever tried this application called Snap Camera, you can actually integrate this with Zoom and you can use filters while you're on Zoom, but they have open sourced it or not open source. They've made the, they've made the development process public such that lots of people can use all of these key points that were identified by people, uh, use them to build their own custom filters that are really fun. So the fact that we have all of these points with these convolutional neural networks is super important to how we can allow the general community to, um, to, to build their own filters. So now you know how snap filters work. It's, it's actually quite cool. And of course, if you're looking for more information, I'll post these slides on the master doc, but you can read the paper here. It was published in 2017. Now, apart from facial, uh, facial, facial feature, facial key point estimation is perhaps a more difficult task called pose estimation, because in faces, it's usually not the case that you'll have two faces super close to each other or blocking each other. Um, you know, if you were doing face estimation with your webcam at home, you have a pretty unoccluded view of your face, of your entire face. And it's pretty straight on other than the fact that when you go side profile. So it's a relatively easier um, um, task, but you have this very difficult task of estimating the pose of people. The image, I mean, the representative image here would be the, I think one of the first things that we showed here. This is what pose estimation is. But as you can see, it's much more complicated because you'll notice that this guy's foot will go in front of his foot and you get a lot of occlusion or this guy goes in front of this person. You can see at this moment, there's occlusion. So you lose the vision view of that person. Then these two people are shaking hands. And as you can see, the other the, this person's left arm is covering their right arm. So there's this whole problem where you're losing information because you can only see things from one perspective. And this is not good. Um, in general, pose estimation is quite difficult, but there was a school paper called PoseNet that came out that uses two convolutional neural networks to uh, estimate the spatial locations of key body points. Let's, uh, let's look at how it works. So first of all, I think we should make a simplifying assumption that there's only one person in the image. 
because this will make the discussion of the convolutional neural network modeling a little bit easier. And moreover, the way that they combine all of these points into you know, different people, they try to separate different people. This actually does not, this actually is a little bit more complicated and I think we can table the discussion for later or perhaps if you're interested, you can read the paper or some blog post about PoseNet. But the most interesting part, and I think the parts that you will find most interesting is how we actually detect key points. So um, imagine that you have an input image here and there is this, uh, there's this image of people playing baseball. I think this is what it is. So imagine that you wanted to predict the key points like you see here. Of course, there are multiple people in this image. Just pretend like there aren't for now. And we will talk about how they're merged maybe later. I'll just one or two sentences it. But you have an input image and you pass it into a convolutional neural network. In fact, I think there are two. And it does a couple of things. First of all, it identifies, uh, it identifies a mask. This is another mask. This is a mask of all the points where it thinks that in general, there could be a body joint there. So it generates all of these heat maps and it makes sort of sense, right? Because you can see the heat map around this dude's knee, around this dude's uh, uh, thigh, thigh bone here, or maybe the knee or the foot, the foot, the elbow, the hand, the shoulder. So this model has learned to, 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 to create masks for that for every pixel, you can identify whether or not this thing is close to a body joint. And it's done a pretty good job of this. And then we will be learning what is called a set of short range offsets. These are actually vectors, 2D vectors. And we will talk about what short range offsets are, but the TLDR is that they help refine the heat maps. You can see that these heat maps are quite coarse, quite coarse, like the, the, the knee is not certainly not that large and certainly the hand is not that large, but by learning these short range offsets, we can, we can refine this, this big heat map down into a single point that's very accurate. Um, and as you, as you might notice, these heat maps are very, very big, but previously when we showed exactly what, uh, what the output came out to be, these uh, points are very small and they're very precise. So we need to understand how this model does all of this cool stuff. So to do this, let's first clarify the whole setup here. Um, there are two convolutional neural networks. This is the first one and this is the second one. As we talked about the first one, we'll learn, the, uh, we'll learn a heat map that determines what is more formally stated as the probability of each pixel being within R of a key point. What does this mean? This is very confusing. So imagine that you have a big image of a person, right? Um, this is an awful image of a person but let's give them an elbow here. This is their elbow. So if you had an image of this person, you want to design a heat map. Now your heat map, I don't think it'd be a good idea if you wanted exactly the pixel that was the elbow to be, to, to, to be red and everything else be blue because that's too, too, too precise of a measurement that we can't really get. And how do you even define somebody's elbow in one pixel? That's like difficult. So what we do is we set a radius R. It's usually maybe like 30 pixels or so. And if you are within this 30 pixel radius, then we will allow you to, to, to predict red or to predict a high probability. And everything else we want to be zero probability everywhere else. What does this do? Well, it gives us this heat map that is very coarse, right? Certainly your hands are not that big, but it gives us a general general idea of the position of the hand. So this is what the first model does. Then there's a second convolutional neural network model that point that creates a vector that points from ij to the key point. So this one is a little bit complicated. But let's think about it. So imagine that you have someone's elbow here, right? I will just draw a very simplified form of an elbow. This is an elbow. And imagine that from our first convolutional neural network, we got a heat map that says the elbow is in this general area. And we have all of these different points as uh, marked as red. Now I'm gonna to switch to a different color here because we will want to draw this differently. If our elbow is right here, then perhaps if we predicted a point out here, this would be bad, right? Because there is not really a key point here. It should actually be over here. So what we do is we draw a vector from every point to the ground truth label for the elbow. 
And we do this for every single point in this disk of radius R. So for, for every point in this disk D, oh no, I did say B. I think my computer is lagging a little bit. So for every point in this disk D, we will draw a vector that points towards the actual location of the elbow. And we just choose some point on the elbow. So every, every point will have, will, will have a, a vector that points to the direction of the elbow. And how are these vectors calculated? Well, they are calculated using the convolutional neural network. This is actually a learned function. So for every single point in the, um, in the input image, it'll draw a vector that points from that point to the nearest key point, to the nearest key point. So what does this do? Well, it gives us sort of a two-step process, right? This is sort of like a two-step refinement process. Why do I say this? Well, at the very beginning, we're predicting this huge area that could contain a key point, right? Um, except this is the first part. And then the second part is we take this huge area and then we draw a bunch of vectors that point towards where the point actually is. And then if we sum all of these vectors, if we sum all of these vectors, uh, my pen is lagging. If we sum all of these vectors, then we get the answer, right? Because if we average all of these vectors, basically, then we will, um, we will, we will, we will, we will sort of get to a location where the model thinks it's most probable that our elbow key point should go. So this is the general idea. And I think it'll be better if we, um, if we go through a specific example so that we can see it in action. So let's go to the next slide. Imagine that we're trying to do this uh, pose estimation thing on this dude here. Let's call him John. I don't know. Let's call him John. Um, and we have a heat map construction. Uh, we have these three steps, right? We, have, we want to first create a heat map. We want to secondly do short range offset vectors. And then third is this voting thing. It's called Hoff voting, but you don't have to worry about this fancy name here. It's just a voting thing. And we'll talk about it in a second. So we construct a bunch of heat maps, right? And without loss of generality, let's consider that we're trying to talk about elbows. We're trying to find his elbows. So remember that the first thing that we do is doing the heat map thing. And this is very coarse grained. So there's a big sort of area here. We'll draw like these really big circles around this person's elbows. So this is basically the first step. We try to, we try to narrow the search space down. Originally, we had this entire image and we're getting kind of annoyed looking at the entire image. So we just find these two areas. So we found these two areas, right? Um, and so this is the heat map construction. We have uh, successfully completed this task, but now we need to do short range offset vectors. So I'll zoom in a little bit and we still have this heat map, right? And we learned a neural network model where we gave it this image and we put it through a convolutional neural network. Remember that convolutional neural networks can pretty much output whatever you want. And it learned a vector v, and it's it's actually just a vector of two values a and b, for every single, for all pixel locations. So for this pixel location, it might point up here. It doesn't really matter because it's not inside the disk. But if it's inside the disk, it'll point towards perhaps where it thinks the elbow is. And you know maybe some of these vectors are noisy. Our model's not perfect, so some of these point that way but most of them point generally in the direction of the middle. So you have vectors for all of these vectors. And if we sum all of these vectors, then we get some, 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 some output vector. Let's call it, dang it, why is my pen being finicky? We will call this output vector V star. And V star is our correct answer because we then we basically sum all of these vectors and the sum is basically the consensus of all of these different things of where the, um, the model, uh, where the elbow is. Now, I've basically described to you what Hoff voting is, except I've left out an important piece, which is that all of these vectors are weighted by the probability. So instead of doing this, actually the equation should read the sum over all of the pixel locations. We can call it IJ because a disk is two dimensional then it's the probability that there is, um, it's the probability of the mask, and I'll explain what this means in a second, at ij 
uh, and then times the vector at ij. The sum of this is actually our answer. So what does this mean? Well, we already talked about the vector, right? The vector is the neural network learned, hey, if you're at this point, you should go this way to find the actual elbow. So it's got all these vectors, but not all, not all of these vectors are equally important, right? If you had a vector that was out here pointing towards his eye, you would not want to factor that in to, uh, to, uh, to his elbow. This would not be something that you want to factor into the elbow. So in fact, you want to weight it by the heat map that you've got out. This heat map, remember, we talked about it as a probability, right? We talked about the probability of ij being within r of that key point. And up here, there's pretty much no probability. The probability should be zero that it's going to be, or very close to zero, that it's going to be part of the elbow. This has nothing to do with the elbow. So then the vector here would be weighted very minimally. You wouldn't weight it very much. Um, and so this is good because then it accounts for each vector based on how confident the model is that this vector location actually is close to the, um, the, um, the actual key point, right? So that is Hoff voting. Well, to recap everything that we've talked about here, um, the whole idea is that First of all, you try to predict for every point in the image, you know, is it, are we close? Are we close to a key point that we're interested in? So this is step one and you ask the question, are we close? Are we close? Are we close at all to the key point that we're interested in? And then secondly, this is step two. We want to refine Apologies for the bad writing. My uh, tablet is sort of lagging. Refine the guess or refine the estimate. And so this takes the very coarse estimate of saying, are we close? And it, it makes it a little bit better. It adds all these vectors together and it figures out where is the best option to be putting this key point. And then, so this gives you all the key points. Once you do the Hoff uh, voting, you'll get these kinds of, this kind of output. And eventually, you can use their algorithm that pieces these things together over different people. It's a greedy algorithm, and it uses some assumptions about how the human body is organized. Like, of course, your shoulders are not going to be attached to your feet. It'll use these kinds of uh, these kinds of priors to take all of these key points and string them together and draw lines so that you get this output that that, that looks at that that looks like the bottom right, and so. This is the whole idea behind pose estimation. So quite a simple idea, right? You ask a neural network to learn a function that asks the question, are we close? And then you ask another neural network to learn the function that asks, you know, how can we refine this very coarse estimate to be better? Um, in general, if you ever have any ideas with neural networks where you want to learn a map from some input to some output, it's usually a good bet to just try deep learning and see if you can figure it out without doing any thinking. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, if it doesn't work, then you have to try something special. So does this make sense to everyone? Thumbs up if it's good. Otherwise, ask questions. Um, I'll give people some time to uh, type them out. Okay, great. Uh, looks like there are no questions. So let's move on. There is a um, paper from the European Conference on Computer Vision from 2018 where this paper was described. And I thought I would mention this. You can actually import this kind of stuff into your, into your computer uh, through TensorFlow. So TensorFlow, TF, Pose, Net. Um, they, actually, they actually support this. Um, in TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow JS. So if you're ever interested in doing this in your browser, then you can use tensorflow.js to, uh, to apply the model that has been learned here. All right. So that was, um, that was pose estimation and key point estimation. So a very interesting uh, sort of way that people have been messing with things. This is how Snapchat filters are made. This is how somehow games perhaps can model the movement of people or maybe if we're trying to teach a robot how to mimic a person you would use key point estimation to deliver the instructions on how to move the joints 
et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, um, those are going to be the major concepts that we're gonna cover today. I'm going to briefly touch on autoencoders and generative models just so that this can get into your vocabulary. You are no way responsible, you're, yeah, you're in no way responsible for fully understanding pretty much anything I've said today, but I think it's going to be good if you walk away with a general understanding of the different tasks in computer vision and, and sort of even hazily how they're done um, would, be, it would be probably my goal today. So really focus on the applications. I think the applications are really cool and they're not too hard to understand, at least in terms of problem formulation. So this shouldn't be too hard. Um, cool. So next we're gonna be talking about autoencoders and autoencoders are typically used for things like compression. What do I mean by this? Well, remember that when we talked about deep learning, we talked about encoders and decoders. The first time that you hear this, you might think that this naturally lends to this problem of compression because if you want to take some big file, then you want to encode it in a representation that's a little bit smaller and then you can decode it later when you want to actually use it. It's sort of like, um, it's sort of like when you're traveling, if you want to pack a bunch of clothes into your, into your bag, you can use those things, th those vacuum bags, where you put a bunch of clothes in and then you suck all the air out, you make it really small so that it can fit into your suitcase. And then once you get to your destination, you let the air back in and let it expand. So this is what compression is about. You want to represent data in a much, much smaller way. So the one way we can do this with neural networks is by using this thing called an autoencoder. And it's basically just this big neural network. These are what we call fully connected layers, obviously, but you can also put convolutional neural networks layer. Like you can make a convolutional, a convolutional autoencoder. But uh, today we'll just be talking about this briefly. The idea is that you learn a bunch of weights that can compress this image. That's 20 by 28. I think that's 784, 784 pixels and you could compress it into a ridiculously small two-dimensional two -dimensional latent space. And um, what this means is that you can take digits. So this is the MNIST data set where you're trying, this is a one, you also have things that are twos, threes, fours. Um, the whole idea is you take all this data and you can represent all of this data, not in 784 numbers, but actually only two numbers. So maybe if you were trying to compress this kind of stuff and sending it over the internet to your friend, you might run the encoder part of the neural network to be like, let's convert this into a two dimensional thing. And then once you're, so then you can send this over the internet, just two, two numbers very, very quickly. And then when you, when you get it to your friend, they can run the decoder and they can reconstruct the image. So the way that you train this is you put in an input image, you have it forward propagate and and you, you minimize the loss with itself. So you want the output to be exactly the same as your input. So your loss function would just basically be X of X. So you wanna input X and you wanna get X back out. Or, or, or in other words, I think this is a little bit incorrect. It would be F of X, which is the predicted, this is the predicted. And this one would be the, the true value. So you would ask a neural network to predict the output given your input and you want it to be exactly like the input. And in doing this, this means that if you put the latent dimension in, if you took it out and then you put it back in later, you could decode it. And you can use this representation as whatever you want to use to send it over the internet as a very compressed format. So this is autoencoders. And then finally, We'll talk very briefly about generative adversarial networks. Um, this is a, a model that can generate things. It can learn to generate fake images of, of text. For example, if you wanted to be able to write numbers, um, you can use this framework to generate a fake eight, for example. Um, and the way this works is, um, it's quite interesting. It's called adversarial because there are actually two networks here. There is a G network called the generator and a D network called the discriminator. And the generator is responsible for generating fake images. It's like a con artist, you know, trying to generate counterfeit uh, dollar bills or maybe fake, 
fake renditions of very famous paintings like the Mona Lisa. And you have a discriminator. And the discriminator takes in, uh, dis the discriminator is also a neural network that learns to differentiate between the ones that the computer made and the ones that are in the training set. So it can figure out whether something is real or fake. And as you can see, these two networks are adversarial. They fight each other. They're not working together. They're actually working against each other. But if you take this neural network and you try to minimize the losses of these two things, you try to, you try to make the generator better at uh, generating fake images. And you also try to make the discriminator better at trying to figure out which ones are fake. When you train these things to th these two things together, you get some pretty, pretty astounding results. So um, eventually what you get is you feed in a random initialization vector. So some random noise and it can generate things that you have never seen before, but you also can't tell whether the, 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 the generative model actually cre uh, created it, or maybe it was a real image. Um, as you might imagine, or maybe you've already heard of this, this is creating very big problems in some areas. There is this thing called a deep fake that you've probably heard of, and people are using it to put words into people's mouths. You've probably seen um, deep fakes being made of presidents. This is particularly harmful. And at this point, it's becoming very, very difficult to tell whether you're looking at something that's real or fake. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going into trying to figure out how to detect these things that are created by generative adversarial networks and uh, how we can verify the things that we see online. Because, you know, 30 years ago, if you saw a picture, it, it was real. And then with the advent of Photoshop, we can no longer trust our eyes when it comes to photos, but it still feels like we can, um, we can trust videos. Unfortunately, now with the advent of generative adversarial networks and these kinds of technologies, we can no longer even trust videos. So you gotta be very careful about what you think of what you see. Um, but here are some examples of GAN outputs. It can generate people with very, very astounding uh, realisticness. Realism is probably the word. So this is a real person. And generative adversarial networks were able to edit this picture of a person and give them different characteristics. It was able to give them bangs, eyeglasses, make them older, make them paler, give them mustaches, you know, open their mouths, close their mouths. And um, it's quite incredible what these things are doing. But just keep in mind that this, any technology comes with implications on society. And this one in particular has some pretty, uh, it has potential for, for good and also for bad in particular. So very cool technology nonetheless. And it's a cool idea where you have two neural networks that are fighting each other. One trying to generate fake things and the other trying to detect the fake uh, items. So that is the conclusion of the presentation for today. I hope it was interesting. The general, let's just try to review everything that we talked about here. At the very beginning, we gave this general framework for machine learning uh, and for computer vision using deep learning, where you take an input that the human understands and you transform it into something that the, per that the computer understands using it, what we call an encoder. So then you take this encoder, you get an encoding, and then you can do whatever you want with it. We talked about classification earlier in the week with uh, convolutional neural networks. But today we talked about the more interesting tasks where you might have more complicated settings, you might have a more complicated output or um, things like that. So uh, any questions before we jump into the lab? Feel free to throw them in chat. Okay, great. Well, um, go ahead and just chill for a second while I pull up our lab information. So let's take a, a quick break. We'll meet back at like 423 or something.
All right, welcome back. So today, uh, just to give you a preview of what's going to happen, we're going to be building a Snapchat filter using facial key point estimation. And then for homework, you will be building out human pose estimation. In fact, I just took a look at the lab and it uses PoseNet. So you will understand the technology that goes on behind the scenes while you implement the, the GUI for the, for the application. So I think this is going to be pretty exciting. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and then I'll send you a link to the information or, or, or to, the, to the URL. So let me drop this in the chat. Please go to it, make a copy or it'll make the, it'll make the project for you. But um, yeah, so you should be able to see something that looks like this. And we will be following the tutorial together and um, seeing whether we can create a, a cool app. So let me know when you are done pulling this up by, by throwing an okay in the chat. And in the meantime, I will set up my casting software so that we can, we can, I can share my screen. And I'll give people like a minute more uh, to pull this up. It looks like only three people have been able to pull it up. Are other people still working on it? Cool, it looks like other people are still working. So we'll give them maybe a couple more minutes. All right, I think I'm just gonna get started. Um, let me connect my screen. All right, so. This should be what you see if you connect it to your device. We haven't really done anything yet. And basically, we're just going to, um, whoops. Yeah, we haven't implemented it, so it does give us errors. All right, we haven't implemented it, so let's go ahead and do so. Um, let's just follow the tutorial. So basically, we've already set up our computer, and there's this thing that explains to us what exactly a model is. And if we click on it, it basically gives us a super high level introduction um, to, uh, to, to, to what a model is. It says the level of math you need to understand are at the university level. Um, but you know 
what's happening and you all are still in grade school. So I think this is super cool, just that you're able to understand things that typically only college students will ever touch. Um, so yeah, based on what we discussed back here with how the convolutional neural network does all of this with its response maps and basically refines them based on the prior, uh, we can do these kinds of things. You basically understand what's happening inside this model. So that's a big step above everyone else. Now let's read this through. The face mesh model gives you the, takes in the image and it gives you the X, Y coordinates of all of your facial features, right? This is exactly what we talked about with pose estimation. And the way that we've, we have implemented this is there is a face extension thing where they have, um, where they have, you know, they, they've done some stuff. They, they've coded up whatever pose, uh, this face, face key point estimation thing there is and they, they've given it for us. And it says, please note that you cannot use the emulator to test your app. Right, you should be using your physical device. All right, so they've got a GUI here. I think it's a pretty simple GUI. They've got three sprites and a canvas. Uh, I hope everyone is familiar with sprites and canvases, but if, in case you aren't, these are basically components that allow you to, to move things around. So your canvas, will allow you to put sprites on it. And these sprites can be moved around. And basically we'll be moving these sprites around based on uh, where the face mesh says our, 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 our body key points are. So let's go ahead and, and continue. This is not so interesting. And apparently our face mesh gives us a bunch of key points. This is pretty much exactly what we talked about, right? This image should look very similar to uh, this image right here where there's a bunch of stuff, left forward, forehead, forehead eyebrow, top, inner corner, whatever it may be. And again, we're starting to see how Snapchat filters can use these to basically mess with the features of our faces. So let's go to next. And the face point format is in the format X coordinate, Y coordinate. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, they give us two options. We can either do a cat or a lion face according to this person. So this would be the cat thing. This one would be the lion thing. Um, what do you guys want to do? I don't really have a preference. Does anyone want to <laughs> choose something for us to use as a group if you have a preference? Cats, okay, let's go with cats, perfect. Thanks. So um, we will want to uh, use all the cat stuff. All right, so then we want to set the images of these, of these sprites to the appropriate thing because we've decided what animal we want. Uh, so we would go to this canvas left ear and we go to the picture and we would be like, ah, okay, so left ear is our left ear, our right ear is um, the right ear, and then of course the whiskers are the cat whiskers. Let's see. Okay, cool. So we have the cat whiskers. It's quite cool, um, but it doesn't move. And that's the biggest problem because if I pull this up on my phone, it, uh, it won't do anything. It'll just, it'll just sit there. And go next. So we've chosen the cat, we filled it in. This is exactly what our device looks like. We can go to our next step. And then we need to write some code. Or let's just take a look at the blocks for now. It says that it's given us some preliminary GUI code. And there's some uh, there's some stuff. So let's go around and let's take a look at what's happening here. Photo count counts how many photos have been taken. Okay, sure. Most recent photo stores the file name of the most recently taken photo. This makes sense because you're gonna be taking photos, you need to save them, and then that's how you can put them into um, your model. Uh, and then got take photo button dot click. It'll save, so it'll save the image into a file name, and then it's going to set this variable to the photo, so then you can access the photo this way. Uh, you're gonna increment your photo count. Not sure why they need this photo count, but sure. And then it'll say photo captured using text to speech. Okay. Um, Share photo button, I think that's just one of the buttons on here. Share most recent image, so I guess you can send to your friends. I am not interested in sending this to my friends, <laughs> but uh, that, that option is there if you want. Um, and then this is really interesting. So they have a function here that tells us to place an image. So you would basically tell a, a, a sprite, it can either be the left ear, the right ear, or the whiskers to be moved to a specific location. And this specific location is defined by the points that we get back from our face model. So you might think that you put your ears maybe on your eyebrows or something. I don't know, maybe something like that. Um, 
So yeah, all right. So that's what this does. We can we can keep on looking. We can look at when face extension dot face updated. We can set the background to the background image. Okay. We can call moving, call resizing. Not sure what all this is, but um, we're going to figure it out soon. So let's just keep going through the um, the tutorial. We've already read through all of these. There's a we've already read through this as well. Placing the ears and whiskers. Okay, this is going to be the most interesting part. So it says by calling in image sprite dot move to, we're going to be moving this to the top left corner. Um, okay, sure. And we want the center of this image to be placed on the face point. So we want to do some simple math to get the coordinates of the top left corner, which we'll call this. So this is their illustration of what's happening. Your, your head key point is going to be right here. But actually, I think that your, your, the location of the sprite is actually corresponding to the top left corner of the sprite. So then you simply have to subtract out the, um, you have to subtract out half of the height and half of the width to get this coordinate from that coordinate. So then you would basically, I think they're asking us to do some coding here. You would want to, you want to do this. So your face point should have a tuple, I think. Let's see. So your face point, how is it represented? Your face point is a tuple. Um, I hope that it's representable by a list. I'm not completely sure, but we will just implement this. And then if it gives us an error, we'll just figure it out. So we can select list item. We're going to select the first thing in the face point. Let's just hope that this works. I have no clue if it is going to because they didn't really specify how face point is structured. But let's just assume that the first index is X and the, first, the second index is Y. So then we can be like, okay, the X that we are looking for is this X that we got from the model. And then we can subtract out half of the image width. So we would put a number here, half, half, and then the image, how would we get the image? Probably we would use something like image. We would use maybe any component, maybe. Any image sprite it should have maybe like a, a width component. And because the image that's being passed in, I think is an image sprite. So we would do this. And then of course we need to change it to height, I think. So for X, it's going to be, so for X, you're gonna to need to subtract the width. So then for the Y, you're gonna to have to subtract the height. So then for the Y, you would have to subtract the height. Where is height? Uh, there it is. So I think this is what they were trying to get us to implement. Of course, it might not work the first time. We'll figure it out if it breaks, but not to worry. Coding is about trial and error. And I think this is generally the idea of what they want us to do. All right, so we've finished this. Then we need to fill in the procedure. Oh, okay, so they gave, they gave us a bunch of hints. Um, let's see if we did this right. So how do I get the height in the widget image? Ah, okay, so we did this right. You use the any component, cool. So we guessed that correctly. Uh, how do I get the number 0.5? Yeah, we figured that out. How do I get face point and image? Okay. How do I get the X and Y coordinates? Ah, okay, so we guessed it correctly. It's basically just a list. So you just selected the list item, face point, index one, index two, and um, there we go. So it looks like we happened to get lucky and we implemented this step correctly, maybe. Uh, so we can move on to the next part. All right. So it says that the phase has been updated. Uh, when it detects a face, it will trigger this event. This is called a callback. So then uh, this event handler has already been created for you, but the moving procedure is incomplete. I think the resizing procedure just depends on how far your head is from the camera. If you're super far, then of course the whiskers and the ears should be smaller and it'll just do some resizing. And they've done that for us, but the code for moving is incomplete and we need to create it. <laughs> so let's look at moving. So we got image, we got moving, and then we gotta, we gotta specify which image we wanna move and which face point we wanna move it to. 
Uh, so I'm going to give myself a challenge and we're going to try to do this without looking at the instructions, see if we can guess what's happening here. Uh, the first part is very straightforward, right? Because you have a bunch of, you have a bunch of, um, you have a bunch of sprites and we just want to put the sprite in. We want to let it know that we're looking at the left ear, the right ear and the whiskers. But how do we find the face point? Well, let me just take a wild guess and think that maybe this one will tell us where it is. Okay, so cool. It's told us where it is. And um, where do we think we should put all of this kind of stuff? Does anyone have any ideas? Where should we put each of these components? Like on which part of the face? We've got chin, forehead, left cheek, eyes, uh, left nose right eye bottom, right forehead. Does anyone want to suggest where we should put the, um, the ears? I mean, just think about it in terms of, um, yeah, exactly. I think this is a good suggestion, right and left forehead, because you're your ears probably should go on the left and right forehead of, of that area. So like around the top of your head. So let's try that. Let's put in the right forehead for, for the right ear and duplicate. We can put the left ear, left forehead. There we go. And then for what, what, what about, what about the whiskers? Um, I don't know what, which one might be best. Does anyone want to suggest? Yeah, I think either top of mouth or maybe bottom of your nose might work. Let's just go with this. Let's try mouth top. And um, there we go. Okay, so we've implemented this. Let's see if we agreed with uh, with them. Okay, yeah, perfect. So actually we, uh, we happened to do exactly what they wanted us to do without looking at the instructions. That's cool. So they asked you to put it with the left forehead, right forehead, and then mouth top. Cool. Let's go to next. Resizing. Um, don't worry too much about this. They basically did this for you. They basically look at the distance between some certain features of your face and they can then estimate how far your head is from the camera and they can make adjustments based on that. If you're interested in this, feel free to look, look, look into this resizing thing. Okay, and, and so it looks like we finished all the code just to rewrap everything. We have something that takes in, that takes a bunch of photos and for each photo, It'll run the face extension. The face extension will figure out what's happening in this image. It'll return all the key points on your face based on this algorithm that we talked about earlier, um, this face, face key point estimation algorithm. And uh, then we can put the ears based on the key points that we found. So we put it on the top of the mouth, the right of the forehead, and the left of the forehead. So this is the moment of truth. Let's take a look at whether this thing works well or not. And I'll just move this over here and split to the right. Whoops, there we go. All right. It disappeared. Okay, so we got this and ah, yeah, see, there you go. Um, so it's detecting all of my facial features. And as you can see right here, um, where the top left and right of my forehead are, it's putting the thing there. And for the whiskers, it's going to put it at the top of my mouth. Now, if I move my phone super far away and I move back, then you will see that the whiskers get smaller. And that's because of their resizing function here, where they look at the distances between certain parts of your face and it'll, it'll, you know, it'll make some adjustments on size. So if I move really far, it'll become small. And if I move really close, it'll become larger. Um, if we ended up doing something wildly different, like we put this on our right cheek, then the, the, uh, the whiskers would be in the completely wrong place. You know, if we put it on our nose, it would look a little bit wrong. I mean, it's covering my eye, but maybe this is like a mask or something. Right eyebrow would look even more wrong. Um, but yeah, I think this is super fun to play with. Uh, you can, let's just go back to mouth top. And this is the most appropriate place. So yeah, 
it's good. Um, everything is working well. And then, of course, if you wanted to change this to a lion, um, we can go to our left ear. We can swap out the pictures for the lion's left ear, the right ear, lion right ear, whiskers, uh, lion whiskers. So it's over here. Then I think we will we will need to refresh our companion screen because it's kind of broken. Or maybe we might to re we might need to reset the connection because sometimes these things are kind of finicky. So it's going to be loading for a moment. And yep, there we go. So we have the lion face down. I don't know why it's stretching me a little bit, but that's OK. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, pretty good. When I rotate, it actually does the rotation pretty well. I'm surprised, actually. Um, so that might be handled in the, in the resizing thing. I am not completely sure. Resizing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might be resizing this based on um, based on your angle. So the face width, if your face width is super small, like from the side profile, then it'll uh, it'll just compress the uh, compress the image. So yeah, this makes a lot of sense. All right. That is the lab. Uh, hopefully you can see now how Snapchat filters work in general. This is sort of a very simplified version of it. But of course, in the future, when you learn how to build all of these things, you will, you will, you will be able to do much cooler things. Um, but yeah, any questions about anything that we talked about today? If not, then we will end a little bit early, and I will send out the instructions for the homework in a um, in the master document. But the the idea is that you'll be building this thing where you can use pose estimation. In fact, this uses PoseNet. That uh, this is exactly what we used. Uh, this is exactly what we talked about with these heat maps and using short range vector offsets to to, to find the, the, the positions of key points on a body. And there are a lot of different cool, complicated things that you can do with this. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. All right.